think. And let me share my screen. Okay, let's continue with the discussion of um, Mesa's pursuit. So last time, again, to, to recall, the idea was that we have this uh, L0 um, type problem. So we want to minimize the L0 norm or the cardinality or basically the number of non-zero elements of theta subject to theta solving this linear system of equations. The, the basically the noiseless regression problem. And this is a highly non-convex problem, so we decided instead to, what people have proposed to solve the L1 relaxation of the problem, where you replace the L0 with L1. And I guess most people are familiar with this um, to some extent. So this appeared uh, in, in stat statistics literature and also um, computer science, electrical engineering, uh, information theory, all, all these uh, areas sort of got very involved in, with this. Um, so this form generally is uh, basically the basis of compressed sensing, the field of compressed sensing, which was quite hot uh, in the past, I would say, 10 years ago, or the past 10, 10 years. Um, and um, so the idea is that the basic question related to this problem is uh, what are the conditions uh, under which the solution of this problem one matches the solution of the original non-convex computationally hard problem. And we discussed this uh, necessary and sufficient condition basically, which is saying that um, these two statements are equivalent. If um, I can recover, um, let's say any, um, let's call this S as sparse in the sense that any vector whose support is uh, in this set S, uh, any theta star whose support is in set S can be recovered uh, by solving the L1 problem, uh, then that statement is equivalent to this condition being true, which is saying that the kernel of X inter intersect with um, this cone is um, trivial. So only zero belongs to that. And this cone um, sort of measures basically uh, the, the vectors that are in some sense undesirable uh, in the sense that um, we saw that this cone is basically um, the union of the support, um, sorry, the union of the tangent cones of these theta star s as theta star varies uh, in, 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 in the set. Uh, the, the set in the set of all like candidate theta stars, the set of all theta stars whose support is in S. So for every theta star, every candidate theta star, we have a tangent cone. And that tangent cone also encodes the set of the same direction. So um, this is saying that if I manage to move in the directions that are in the tangent cone or in the CS, which is the union of all, then um, there exists a theta star in support as such that I can reduce the norm, um, the L1 norm of the vector by moving in that direction, which then violates the idea that theta star is the unique solution of the L1 problem. And so this condition just roughly, or once you look at the proof, just means that the set of all um, possible descent directions and the set of all feasible directions, so feasible directions are the directions that are in the kernel of X, these are the things that if I move along those directions, I, I remain in the feasible set. This is trivial, the intersection, there's no non-trivial vector in there. So I can't, um, I can't descend on any of the theta stars in terms of the L1 norm. So, and it still remain in the feasible set. Um, so it has some very interesting intuitive, um, uh, basically, justification. Okay. Questions about this?
uh, okay, so one one uh, uh, last sort of piece that we did last time was this uh, argument that the CS in, indeed is the um, union uh, of these tangent cones. And the argument here is basically the general argument that you use for um, doing um, like manipulations with this L1 or So what you do is, in this case, the, the idea was to show that any delta in the tangent cone is uh, going to be in, in so in the, any delta in one of these tangent cones would be in, in, in the CS and vice versa. And so the, the idea was to take this um, definition of the tangent cone with t equal to one. So what I'm looking at here is uh, the set of all deltas such that theta star uh, plus delta one is less than or equal to theta star. Um, because if I have such delta for a given t, I can always re-escape it to get a new delta with t v one. So without loss of generality, I can I can work with these things. Okay. And if I have a delta in this, then um, this is sorry, this is um, this is basically t one. Um, so delta is in this if and only if, um, I'll break this basically, okay, I have this here. Uh, I have written already this here. So that's this. And then I break this term into um, the on support plus the off support pieces. So remember the, the way that I have defined these, um, the on support and the off support are sub. Uh, so this is, this is the on support part, this is the off support part. So these are sub vectors of the original vector. And uh, the L1 norm of uh, delta is basically additive. So it's going to be the L1 norm of this piece plus, it's not difficult to see that L1 norm has this additive property. Okay. And, um, we can also see, for example, there are other properties, like if I have x plus delta s, obviously this can be written as x s plus delta s. So if I subdivide the sum, it's as if I add the subdivided pieces. Uh, so using the, these ideas, you can just write this down as, um, so this guy can be written as, um, as the L1 norm of the on support plus the L1 norm of the off support. Uh, and then the, the pieces decompose. Uh, the, um, the key is that the theta star of uh, S complement is zero. And so if you rearrange this inequality, you get this. Okay, so you do um, rearrange the, um, basically this one goes this side and uh, this guy is moved to the other side. And so it's not hard to see that this is true. Um, and then you use the triangle inequality. This is going to be bounded by delta S1. Okay, so this shows that the delta that was in that tangent cone is in the, the C cone. Um, and then you can also show that, in fact, then you take the supremum over all possible uh, theta star s, uh, the, um, uh, this inequality has to be equality. Okay, so there is a, I should write a better thing. So, so there exists, there exists a theta star s such that the equality holds. So for every delta that you pick, um, you can find the theta star such that, um, oh, sorry, no, um, not that. Uh, not that, that, not that one. Um, 
as well. I don't think this is correct. Um, so this one, so this is going to be um, so this expression is equivalent to this. So, so delta being in, in this is equivalent to this. Uh, and delta being in uh, basically the union of these tangent cones is equivalent to this. Okay, and, and this side is equal to that. So it's a little bit tricky, but um, so you can follow the, the implications and uh, it should be, okay, so um, this is equivalent to this and this holding for some theta star is equivalent to this. Uh, and, and then you can show that uh, this side is basically, um, the supremum is equi equal to this. And then that would, that would show that the union of those cones is basically the other cone. Okay, does that make sense to people? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Just, just verify this for yourself. It's not that I, difficult. Yeah. I have one question on the pictorial proof. Okay. So yes. how is the union of these two t theta one and t theta two is this? So I don't. Look. I mean, pictorially, you because the uh, points are uh, because this. Theta star one is zero comma one, and theta star two is zero comma minus one. Yeah. So, so how will the, the how will they add? I mean, theta one star is not same as theta two star. Theta one star lies above than theta two star. So how is the right. union of these two is the like, right? No, the tangent cone is. So the tangent cone is defined centered at the origin. So if you look at this definition, mm -hmm. right? So delta equal to zero is always in the tangent cone, right? So when you look at the tangent cone, you should think of this, uh, I think I mentioned this, so you should think of this as being centered at the origin. So the origin is here. Okay, for the other guy, the origin is here. Theta star is zero comma one, like theta star one is zero comma one. Right, but I'm looking at deltas. So deltas are satisfied. So theta star is not. So this is the set of all um, deltas that. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Right. Okay, set of all okay. The okay, okay. Right. Got it, got it. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you, thank Great. you. No problem. Okay. Other questions? Okay, seems like no other questions. So let's move on. So this is a proof, and this sort of settles the the problem that we, or the question that um, some of you also pose. Um, and this, at this point, the, the problem reduces to figuring out when this is true. Um, and as you can imagine, and there were some other criteria, subspace, like neural space criteria that I guess Zach pointed out. Uh, and um, there was some discussion on, on campus wire that they're equivalent. So I just want to point out that that condition is equivalent to, um, so what we have here is for a single S, if you require it to hold for any S of a of subsize K, uh, or if you want to size at most K, then this condition, you have to take the union of this condition over all possible S um, of size K, that would give you the other condition. Okay, so in a sense, this is more refined. So this is saying, what is the exact condition I need if I care about this particular support? And the other condition is saying, what is the necessary and sufficient condition if I care about any support of size K, or at most K? Um, okay. So this is not easy to verify in general, as you might imagine. So we have tried to come up with uh, alternative conditions that are sufficient for this whole. Um, so I'm going to go over some of them briefly, and some of it you work out in the problems. Um, one 
one set of sufficient conditions is um, through this notion of pairwise inquiry. So you have, um, so as you can imagine, again, this is, the C of S is a subset, sorry, it's a subset of R, um, let's say RD, I believe. Yes, and it just depends on the support S. So this has nothing to do with the, the data in the problem. Uh, whereas the other one, Kernel of X definitely depends on, uh, so this depends on the data. And the data. Uh, and so it, it, that's basically what, what we, we, we need. So we need conditions on X such that um, this is basically satisfied. And we usually care about this being satisfied for all subsets of, of a given size as the other no space property is. Um, mm. The phrase basically. So what we have here is a sufficient condition. So consider uh, the columns. So let's call the jth column of x, xj. Uh, what I would have here is um, I can I can look at this inner product of pairwise inner product of a pair of um, columns, and then divided by n. The n is for normalization usually, as you will see, um, because these matrices are, um, so x is, this, this is not correct, so this should be, I believe this should be n by d. Okay, there's, this is a design. So each column is uh, dy1, and there are n of them, so um, basically, sorry, the, 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 each 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 uh, is uh, in R. Yeah, I believe I made a mistake. Let's see if this is okay. Um, yeah. So each one is right. So. X, xj is in Rn, okay, the, sample, the size of the sample size. So this normalization makes sense, uh, as we'll see. Um, but the idea is that this is either 0 or 1. So this is saying, uh, basically, this, this is the indicator. So this is either 1 if i is equal to j and 0 other. So this is saying this inner product properly normalized. Um, is either close to one, if I'm looking at basically the norm of a single column, or it's close to zero if I'm looking at the um, two disjoint columns or two distinct columns. Um, the um, the idea is that the the matrix, if the columns of X are roughly orthonormal after after, or the columns of X over root n basically. So this is saying columns of um, x over root n are nearly, this is not saying it, but this is, uh, so if this is a small, uh, should we do? let's try this. So, so the condition is that we, 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 we would like this to be small. So if this is small, this is saying if, And columns of x over root n are nearly orthonormal. Uh, do you need some scaling here of the entries of the matrix x because they can be any number right. over reals? That's what I'm saying. So this is divided by root n. See, that's the. Uh, uh, but entries can be anything, right? Entries can be anything. So yeah, I, what I'm trying is to the say is length. Right, so what I'm trying to say, this is going to be yeah. sufficient. So the kernel of x does not depend on the scaling, right? So I'm going to look at certain matrices that have properties that, because you can always rescale columns. So the, the kernel of x is not going to be affected by, um, by rescaling the, uh, the columns. Yes. Uh, is that correct? On uh, the scaling of the whole matrix, I'm not sure about the columns. Uh, 
yeah so yeah i believe that yeah even the uh, left null space yes but right null space i don't know right so yeah so you can rescale all the columns by a certain uh, amount such that let's say a given size is achieved okay so this condition is assuming that the x is or x transpose x as you can see so the x this this these are the entries uh um basically these are the entries of x transpose x over n what i'm going to say is that i've properly normalized so that this is comparable to identity okay that's what we care about okay. um, as you'll see this is not saying that these conditions are uh, necessary and sufficient i'm going to give you a set of Sufficient conditions and oh, uh, I see. I they see. are. I see. They are going to be on a scale that that is reasonable for us. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, what here is going to happen is so if I look at this matrix x transpose uh, x over n and subtract the identity, and if I look at this infinity norm, which is basically um, the infinity norm of the matrix viewed as a vector, so this is um, just maximum or uh, i and j of uh, uh, all the entries. So x transpose x over n minus i p i j, which gives you the other definition. OK, so this is the ma maximum absolute value of the entries of uh, the matrix. Um, so you can see that you're comparing this gram matrix normalized to the identity uh, in a certain norm. Um, and so proposition 7.1, which I believe you also show in one of your homework problems probably, um, is saying that um, in order for the restricted normal space property to hold for all s of size at most level s, uh, it's enough to have this uh, pairwise incoherence condition or pairwise incoherence constant being less than 1 over 3s. OK, that's one possibility. So you can see that it means that things are small, uh, much smaller than, than one. When is it? It's, it's large. So this is one sufficient condition. Okay. Questions? This I believe you're going to prove. I'm not going to prove it here. No, okay. So uh, this is fairly restrictive as we'll see. Um, the next set of conditions or the next uh, uh, common popular uh, condition is restricted isometry property. And this is uh, more relaxed and it's defined like this. So um, we say that x satisfies restricted isometry property of order s with constant uh, delta s. Uh, if uh, this deviation from the identity, if you measure it in the operator norm, which hopefully you remember, uh, is bounded by, by this, this constant for all subsets S of a uh, given size, size of most S. Okay. Um, so this operator norm is more uh, reasonable or more uh, interesting for matrices instead of measuring things in terms of the L infinity norm uh, of a vector um, or entry wise basically maximum of the entries or absolute value of the entries this is measuring something related to the spectral properties of the matrix and um, you would expect this to behave much better um, in general not necessarily much better but but probably more relaxed. Um, so, uh, so the pairwise incoherence um, in the case where s is equal to 2 um, is going to be close to this, um, but not in general. So I'll let you sort of think about this. Um, if, for example, the, the columns are normalized such that the norms are exactly root n, so the norm of each column is exactly root n, then you can show uh, for yourself that the, um, the RIP constant with s equal to 2 is the same as the pairwise incoherence constant. Um, 
But otherwise, um, you can see this inequality, which is one of the other exercises in the book, that the RIP constant is sandwiched between this pairwise incoherence and S times the pairwise incoherence. And so, uh, what you can, uh, I'm gonna give you the condition, come back here later. So the condition that you need for, or the sufficient condition for, for the city normal space property to hold for all, um, S less than or equal to S is that this, this guy is less than, or delta 2S for a subset of size 2S basically is less than one pair. Um, which if you compare uh, with this one, so we need here that this being uh, less than or, this was the sufficient condition that we could do. Uh, the other one is saying that this is, or basically um, delta 2s being less than or equal to one over three over s, sorry, three. Um, Uh, and you can see, for example, from this side of the inequality, let me do this more properly. So one is, uh, so for example, if I have delta PW of X is less than one, uh, over 3s, then this implies that delta 2s, for example, is less than or equal to uh, 2 third, okay? Which is not good enough, but let's say if this is less than 1 sixth, which is of the same order, then this is gonna be less than 1 third. So the pairwise incoherence, uh, this condition with a factor of two, if it's satisfied, then it would, it would imply um, this other guy. Uh, however, uh, the reverse is not true. So for example, if I had this um, restrict RIP condition, then it doesn't apply the condition about the pairwise incoherence. So pairwise incoherence is in general stronger and more restrictive. Okay. Uh, so I think this this one that your book proves, I'm not gonna prove it. The, the, the proof uses something called a shifting the shifting lemma, which is interesting. Uh, and I guess the it was originally thought of by uh, in the paper with Candace and Tao, uh, probably by um, um, uh, Terry Tao from, from our uh, math department here. So, um, so this I also, I think I have some additional problems on, on, on the website or in the folder that I have. So it goes through some of the steps of this shifting idea for some of the other homework problems that you do. So read the proof of this yourself. So read the proof, read the proof, and read about well, the shifting limit from the exercises. Um, and then you do some of this in your exercises. And, um, it's interesting what you can do with it. But um, the proof is a little bit tricky. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, let, me, let me just add this and then ask for more questions. So another way of writing this uh, condition, uh, the RAP sort of constant is uh, by defining this so-called um, sample covariance matrix. So design for us so far has been, uh, deterministic, we haven't made it random. Uh, but let's say I formed this, this object, uh, and this object, if I call the um, i throw of x, so x is this matrix, n by d. And so if I call the i throw x i transpose, then you can verify that, um, so this is the itro. Uh, then you can verify that one over n x transpose x is basically one over n the the, the summation of x i x i transpose. So if x i's are um, zero mean, uh, 
makes nice or random and zero mean, then this is a sample covariance matrix. And it's working about these things as, as sample covariance matrices. Uh, so in particular, the expectation of, um, so uh, the expectation of sigma hat would be um, expectation of x1, x1 transpose, which would be the covariance of x1. So make uh, expectation of x1 is zero. Okay, so this would be an unbiased estimator of the covariance matrix. And so what this condition is saying is that, um, so you can think of this as, uh, if you write it down, it would be the SS subplot of sigma hat. So uh, what I mean here is, so if you divide the sigma into S and S complement, here S and S complement, then what I would get is this would be sigma SS. And you can easily verify that this is indeed equal to XS transpose XS. So the RIT condition is saying that this subblock uh, is close to the identity uh, in operator norm. Uh, in particular, if this is less than delta, um, then this would be I of S basically. Um, you can less than delta less than one, then you can um, easily argue from the definition of the operator norm that, so this condition is equivalent to this, that sigma hat SS applied to any U. Um, so this L2 norm is, is very close to the L2 norm of U up to a factor of one minus delta and one plus delta. So that, 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 is, that is saying, so if, um, if I would have sigma hat S, S u is equal to this for all u, then this would be an exact isometry. Okay. Um, this is saying that, um, sorry, let's say uh, if I had sigma hat, then it says that sigma is an exact isometry. It's an exact isometry. So this condition is saying that uh, sigma hat, basically sigma hat restricted, trick to S by S sub matrices is approximately uh, isometry, is an approximate isometry. Maybe that's why it's called restricted isometry property. Okay. So maybe we can write it somewhere else cleaner. So a star says that sigma hat restricted to S times S sub matrices is an approximate isometry. Okay. And that's the RIP sort of. Name. Any question? And that's the sufficient condition. Any question? Okay, so one of the other things that you probably show in your homework problems is this that if I have a X being a sub Gaussian matrix, with IAD entries and every entry is zero mean and unit variance, uh, then in order for this pairwise inquiry and sufficient condition to hold, uh, it's enough to have n bigger than or equal to a constant times s squared log b. 
So if n is bigger than or equal to s squared log d, then with high probability, this is with high probability. That random x satisfies this pairwise incoherence condition. Um, and furthermore, you can show that if is n is bigger than or equal to a constant times s log e d or s, so e is the natural, not the natural, it's like the uh, Euler's uh, constant. Uh, basically, s log d over s, if you don't care about constants. Uh, then their RAP condition holds with high probability. So uh, what, what is interesting is that these two uh, conditions are different in terms of the sample complexity. So generally, the, con the, con the conditions for, um, for guaranteeing the pairwise incoherence are uh, stronger, as you would imagine. Because the condition is stronger, so you're, you need more samples. So the sample size here grows like a squared log. Uh, whereas for the other one, um, you only need, um, maybe I'll do this. This is bad, so this gets this color. Um, this, is, this is good, so this gets the green color. So here, this is like s, and then log d over s is a little bit better as well. But um, the key is that one grows with a squared, the other one grows with s. So this is called sample complexity, how much sample size, so how big of a, of a sample size we need. A certain property to hold. Okay. And this is another exercise that you're going to do. You're going to show this, and you get a better understanding of the nature of these uh, conditions. So, any question about the pairwise incoherence or RAP conditions? So, these are all sufficient conditions for that null space condition we discussed. Maybe I'll pause a little bit, see. So far, so good. Yeah, the reason I'm not proving things is most of this uh, is gonna be homework problem, or is going to be your job in homework problems, except for this proposition two, which you should treat yourself. Um, but these conditions are not, not, not none of which are um, necessary. Not, neither the pairwise incoherence nor the RIP. And in fact, in cases where the statisticians are the cases where interest, the statisticians are interested in, um, in those cases, these conditions sort of generally fail. Uh, and what are those con the cases? Um, again, let's, let's think of the random design setup where it's a random design, where we draw these entries um, randomly, but assume that each row has uh, a certain covariance matrix. So suppose that we draw from Gaussians, so the rows are, um, the rows of X are Gaussians with, with a certain covariance matrix. Okay, so this is saying that, so the rows are IID. Um, so this is the I row. Let's so say this is XI transpose if you want. And the rows are IID and draw, the, are drawn from uh, a Gaussian with a certain mean and covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix might not be identity. So the sigma might not be identity. And it just says that there, are, so the, the columns are uh, the covariance in regression. So this is saying the covariance are uh, generally correlated, which is true. 
So for example, these could be like weight, height, I don't know, blood pressure, blood sugar level, or like cholesterol level. Or, um, so these, these things are related to the age and like other, other sort of characteristics of a person. And it's very unlikely that these are independent or IID. And so it's natural to assume there is a not identical variance matrix. And for example, a simple example for theoretical purposes is this covariance matrix that has, um, it's just a convex combination of the identity and the all ones uh, matrix. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so this is the all ones matrix and this is the identity matrix. So this matrix that is defined like this is um, just, I believe uh, it's just going to be one in the diagonal and mu elsewhere. So there is a, so everything else here is mu. Um, so I'll do this. Um, all of these are mu. Mu here. Okay, so there is a constant correlation of mu or covariance to mu. And this is an example of a so-called spike covariance matrix. Um, uh, why this is called a spike? Because um, anyone knows the eigenvalues of this matrix? Let's see why it's called a spike. What are the eigenvalues? Anyone? No answer there. Eigenvalues. No one wants to comment. I guess it would be good. So, what are the eigenvalues of uh, this matrix? One minus mu? Yes, all of them are one minus mu. How about the eigenvalues of this guy? This is d by d. So these are d by d. Fun zero zero zero. So one, one transpose. Mm -hmm. This, this matrix, this, this one has an eigenvector of one. The one D is an eigenvector because if you multiply it, you get D times one. Yes. D one D transpose. Okay, and then the rest of the eigenvalues are zero because zero. it's a rank one matrix, mm -hmm. right? So this would have, um, so this part would have eigenvalues d times mu and then zero. And if you add, add a um, identity matrix, you just shift all the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues would be um, one minus mu plus uh, mu times d, one minus mu plus zero, dot, 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 one minus mu plus zero. Okay. So all the eigenvalues are one minus mu, except one, which is one minus mu plus mu d. And this has, uh, the, um, sorry, this is wrong. And this has the um, eigenvector 1D associated with it. Okay, so the eigenvector here is going to be 1D. Um, 
so that's that's the spike. So the spectrum is spiked, uh, and then the, that spike is the eigenvector is one d. So you can detect one d if you like threshold the eigenvalues of this matrix um, at le an, a, a level between one minus mu and one minus mu plus mu d. You can recover that that spike that one d. Whatever you put there, actually, you could you could have put like mu u transpose here it would be a general spike. And you could re recover that. Um, anyway, so uh, why this is interesting is because uh, so this notation is not your book's notation, maximum eigenvalue. Um, by the same argument that I did, uh, if you look at the um, S by S sub matrix of this guy, uh, the S by S sub matrix is another matrix like this, but S dimensional. So the eigenvalues would be um, exactly this, but with D replaced with S. Um, and so the largest, this is the notation for the largest eigenvalue. So the largest eigenvalue of sigma SS is going to be uh, 1 plus mu times S minus 1. OK, it comes from this with um, D replaced with S. So um, why is that significant? Um, why is this significant? And this goes to infinity as this goes to infinity. Can a matrix like this satisfy the RIP condition? So can, let's say, sigma SS satisfy this RIP condition? No. No, why not? Because here the maximum eigenvalue is bounded. Right, so if you go, this is saying that uh, um, sigma, let's say, I'm, I'm applying it to sigma SS. Sigma SS is very close to I in terms of the spectrum. So, and in particular, you can just go verify that this inequality, which is equivalent to that, gives you that all the eigenvalues are between 1 minus delta and 1 plus delta. So they're within a delta, like perturbation of delta of the eigenvalues of identity. So in other words, um, so I want to do um, so let's open a page here to crowd it. Um, so no, this is that. Maybe here. Um, sorry, let's see. Let's see if I can put this out. Cut. Okay. Uh, Open a page here. Another page. Oh, sorry. It's okay, free lab. Mm. This is bad. Okay, okay, you're okay. So what I want to say is the let's do a bit of a different color. So this guy implies the right. Um, this guy implies that lambda i sigma s s minus one is less than or equal to delta. So, so all the eigenvalues are less than or equal to um, one. Uh, sorry, the, the distance between the, the eigenvalues and one are less than delta. So this can't satisfy that property um, because that, the largest eigenvalue is going to infinity as it goes to infinity. Um, and um, by proxy, it can't satisfy the pairwise coherence because that's a stronger condition. And you can show in angle size 7.8, I forgot whether we assigned it or not, but um, you can show that the pairwise incoherence in fact is violated with high probability for the Gaussian, for this Gaussian that we have, uh, unless um, mu is less than or equal to one over S, which is saying that the, the, the correlation should be very small as, as, as becomes big. Um, and RIT is violated unless mu is less than or equal to one over mu. Um, 
And in fact, it can show that the, the, this, this RIT constant grows like mu times root s, which gives you that. So uh, both of them are restrictive. So they put the strong restrictions on. So again, you can see RIT has less restrictions, but still um, the restriction is uh, severe. So as um, S becomes large, uh, you can't have any non-vanishing correlation. Uh, however, you can show that uh, null space property or null space condition that we had um, restricted null space property is satisfied for any mu between zero and strictly less than one. So no matter how big mu is, as long as it's less than one, which is the maximum they can be, uh, one is the maximum they can be to make this matrix um, still positive semi definite. So except one, which is uh, like a corner case, all the other values are, for, for, for all the other values, you have the restricted null space property. And so basis versus succeeds succeed with high probability. Um, and you can show that the basis, per, like the, this is saying this is um, so restricted null space, restricted null space property holds. Uh, so this implies that in high probability. So the basis pursuit succeeds. Okay. So the condition, this the sample complexity that uh, you need is this, and this is sort of optimal. We can't we can't do better than this. We can prove that. More or less, this is the order of uh, um, sample complexity needed for for the sparse recovery problem. Um, okay, does that make sense to people? So this this result will show as um, I'm gonna give a result later, which um, as a special case gives this, uh, but I'm not gonna prove that result. That uh, depend on how, how much time you have. If you're interested, you can present things around that. But uh, we'll see a stronger result that um, gives this, this um, statement that I have here as a special case. But this is an overview of what kind of uh, um, results you can get. To summarize, let's say if you think about um, the random design, um, you can translate these conditions into sample complexities. And you can see that um, with sort of IID entries, uh, the RAP gives you this sample complexity. This is the more or less optimal sample complexity. Um, I mean, this is enough to, to guarantee uh, RAP. And as a result, the, um, the signal space property um, this sample complexity is enough to guarantee this, and as a result, the restricted the normal space property. So it's easier to show, um, but neither of them are enough uh, for this setup. And um, but this setup is still in this setup. If mu is less than one, um, we can show that let's say for the Gaussian with this covariance matrix, um, with high probability, the restricted normal space property holds. So you get. Um, you get the um, basis pursuit. Um, you get that the basis pursuit succeeds if, if the sample size is this big. Okay. Okay. Questions. So uh, I'm just wondering, have you answered the question uh, that m minimizing the L0 norm is same as L1 norm under this condition or something? So yes, what have you shown? Yeah. Just, uh, so you tell me what have been, what have Yeah, I'm a little bit <laughs> confused what's going on. So, um, what these things are saying is that, um, for example, uh, if your matrix is um, so, if you have a matrix X mm -hmm. which has entries IID sub Gaussian with these uh, features like zero mean and variance one, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Okay. Then if you take, for example, the sample size to be this big, so mm -hmm. the dimensions of the matrix have to be, um, um, so recall that we're, we're dealing with a um, high dimensional setup, right? So N is, N is much smaller than D, mm -hmm. okay? So this is saying that that's okay, uh, as long as N is bigger than uh, a fraction, which is, uh, let's say, S log D or S. So that's the much smaller piece, okay? Mm -hmm. As long as N is bigger than uh, this much, um, then uh, up to a constant, then the RIP condition holds. And the RIP condition, if this condition holds, then this result is saying that uh, restricted null space property holds for all S. Let's for all S with S less than, okay. We, we right. So you Which, are saying that for, uh, so you can read, so if your optimal th theta star, if it support size is at most small S, then yes. and this, then this is high probability you recover that if okay. you use that design matrix. Let's, I see, I see, okay. okay. That's what it is. Okay. Good. Yes. Sounds good. Uh, yes. So don't we have to take this support matrix with the scales with the, with N? Uh, so this doesn't care about the scaling. So this is, this result is true for any N, S and D. No, no. What I'm saying that the entries here, you are taking sub Gaussian entries. So I'm, I'm saying that uh, don't you have to scale by one over whatever N or square root N or something? No, this is, this is good enough. So you're going to show it. Uh, so uh, what happens is, um, so as I mentioned, we, what we care about is uh, oh, you, the, do, you do scale here by the, the factor of n, right? Right, these conditions, the factor of n is already encoded. Oh, OK, here. OK, OK. Right. Got it, got it. OK, so, so you, you want, do scale with the factor of n. Right, so you want the columns to be roughly of, of norm root n. And, 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 and I mean, for these conditions, at least. That's for the restricted null space property. But for these conditions, for the RIP, for example, the RIP is saying that basically this guy is close to this. So the uh, L1 norm of the columns should be close to, sorry, L2 norm of the columns should be close to uh, root n. Mm, uh, yes, yes, yes. Right, and this is satisfied for this kind of matrices. Oh, I see. Right, okay. so if you look at... I see, I see, okay. The L2 norm squared of each column is N, okay? So the L2 norm, yes, the expectation. Yes, so yes, 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 okay. Right. Oh, so, okay, so you are saying that the for a matrix X, if the entries are sub-Gaussian, then if you take any columns of uh, whatever size as log D or something, they are roughly orthonormal, any set of uh, S columns. If uh, N is at least this, S log D, then it, and if you- Yes, any, so any columns, subset of size all, two, right, they're almost, in the sense that the same quality holds with like I see. two thirds and like four over two. Yeah. I see. Yes, that's another consequence of this result. But, that is the only thing that you need to uh, recover, right? Uh, in principle. Uh, I don't understand what you're asking. No, what I'm saying that if you, no, probably I'm not. So you want to recover theta, like the theta star, right? No, um, you would recover theta star if theta star has support less than low S. Yes, yes, no, suppose we are with high given volume. that this support is less than S. Yes. Yeah, probably I'm a gun. So the idea is this, so pick, pick a matrix X here, uh -huh. uh, N by D, such that um, the entries are IID sub Gaussian with zero mean and variance one. Yeah. Okay, fix that matrix. 
then uh, with high probability uh, for any play test um, for any theta star whose support is um, at most has a size s, if I solve this problem, yeah, you uh, can record the problem, answer of that. I get yes. the same, yes. That is the, the second one, actually, yes. Does that make sense? Yes, 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 yes. Right, and then the high probability result is uniform in, in theta star. So there is like an event of high probability is such that on that event, no matter what theta star of support size S you plug in, the solution is gonna come out to be theta star, which is an interesting result. Right? It's not saying that there are different events for different theta stars. There is a single event based mm -hmm. on X basically, such that no matter what theta star you plug into that problem, when you solve it, you get back theta star as long as the support theta star is less than s. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Other questions? Yeah, it's a little tricky, but uh, it's like a modular proof. So you just, um, each piece uses different techniques. So this, this slide that I'm showing you, this uses techniques that you're gonna use from like concentration inequalities to show this. But once you show, for example, this, the fact that this implies the restricted normal space property is a different argument. And the fact that restricted normal space property is equivalent to exact recovery in the basis pursuit is just the argument that we did. Okay. Sounds good to people. Okay, let's move on. Uh, so, um, Classically, this has been interesting, but for statistics purposes, it's a little bit um, uh, idealistic because uh, there's no noise. So people started looking at the uh, noisy version, which, as one of you pointed out, um, basically uh, reduces to this outline regularized, or the, the popular approach to, to dealing with the noise or noisy problem is, so noisy problem has, um, assumes that y comes like x times theta star plus w, okay? And um, there's this uh, generally um, either Gaussian or sub-Gaussian noise. And um, it doesn't make sense to try to solve the exact um, linear system y equal x theta. So instead people try to um, sort of uh, solve the least squares problem, but add a penalty of uh, a one one. And this is, if you, uh, you probably, most of you have, have heard of this or seen this in previous courses, it's called the lasso, and has been study, studied extensively. Um, the idea is that um, minimizing this um, L1 penalized version leads to, um, generally sparse solution. So without this penalty here, uh, this would be the least squares problem and it doesn't have a unique solution as we discussed before. So the kernel of X is non-trivial. Um, so you can make it zero, the objective function, and it's not that interesting. Um, so adding this L1, so you can add L2, for example, L2 squared, that would be the ridge regression, but the solutions wouldn't be as sparse. It takes care of the, uh, in conditionness of the problem, but the uh, uh, solutions will be as far as this is a similar idea that similar sort of um, relaxation idea. So you would uh, have liked to replace this with L0 uh, and solve this, which is a sort of variant of uh, AIC or BIC problem. Um, but instead, you relax it to L1. And uh, this, you get the convex problem. So the objective is a convex function. There, there are no constraints, so this is an unconstrained convex problem. And, and it's sort of easy to solve. There are other options. You can, you can plug, uh, like put the, const, the, the L1 sort of norm as a constraint on the problem. And um, we'll see, there is a result in the book that sort of relates the, the solutions of the two. But the more common approach is this, 
and then you control the level of sparsity by by choosing this regularization parameter lambda. So if I increase lambda, um, I get sparser solution. If I decrease lambda, I get denser solution. Okay, if I increase lambda very much, at some point you get zero. You get the solution which is identically zero. Um, and so the choice of this is a matter of um, concern. Um, we'll see some theory of how you should choose it, but practical aspects are a different story. Okay, is the um, setup clear? So what we would like to do is that we would like to see what happens if the, if the data comes in like this and we plug that y in here and solve this problem, do we get back something close to data star? We can't hope to get data star itself, but we can hope to, for example, uh, so if uh, we solve six for y equal x data star plus w, can we hope to show show that uh, theta hat minus theta star, let's say in L2 norm is uh, small, something is small. Uh, even when B is much larger than it, even with the sample size small, can we still recover to the theta star uh, in some sense? In an approximate sense. Okay, that's the goal. So I have one question. Okay, go ahead. So uh, is the philosophy the same here? So uh, our ideal goal is to minimize one over two n this y minus x theta square plus L zero norm of theta. But yes. since you can't do it, that's why you are relaxing. Yes, okay. yes, that's what I mentioned. So not not. Just the L zero, but the lambda times L zero. So we want to L zero. Yes. So will we get to the like similar kind of? Or do we hope the similar kind of thing happening uh, here? Like. Or? Right. We're not gonna. The thing is, we're not gonna show. Um, so in the basis pursuit, you could ask whether you could recover the exact solution. Huh. The, the complexity here is that you're not going to be able to recover the exact solution. Even if I know the actual support of S theta star, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of the noise, I get something which is different than theta star. Right? So the ideal thing would be to solve, um, so let's say, uh, if, see if I can do this here. Um, Add something here. Just doesn't quite work. Okay. Forget about that. Uh, so suppose um, so the best so suppose um, the support of theta star is s, and let's say the cardinality is uh, less than or equal to s, much less than n. So what we can, like the so-called oracle way of doing it is that I can try to minimize, um, let's say one over two n, y minus x sub s, theta star sub s, uh, or theta star sub s in R D. So I can restrict to that, that that subset S, so basically this is X, um, sorry, not theta, it's uh, theta S. So I'm just gonna zero out everything else except the, the part in the support, the actual support. Uh, so I'm gonna just, uh, let's say zero out here as well. So this is X sub S. So I'm gonna just work with the columns in S, okay, and then uh, this is going to be a regression problem with like the traditional regression problem. The number of columns is much smaller than sample size. And this is the optimal thing to do to try to solve this. And um, you get the solution, 
which which would be different than theta star uh, and or theta star s. And so the the question is how far can we get to this oracle problem? Okay, rather than trying to recover the exact theta star, uh, can I recover something which is close to this guy, which knows the support of theta? Okay, that would be our goal. This is the Oracle solution. Does that make sense? Suppose I know that theta star is um, like this, then x times theta star would be just x s times theta star s. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm just going to go work with the design x sub s. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, right, so other questions? We're almost out of time, so let's see if I can. Um, so let me just maybe mention this and then come back next time. So in order to do this, you're going to basically upgrade this uh, null space property that we had. So we start, this was successful, um, and we try to, but this is for the noiseless case. We need to strengthen this result or this property, and once we have that, then we can we can show what we care about. So the way to strengthen it is uh, a first um, first step is a mild strengthening. So I'm gonna or generalization. I'm gonna add an alpha here in the definition of C. Um, so S is there as well, but but you have C of alpha. So I might have to. Um, work with, with these cones for a different alpha. And I also gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm um, gonna, I'm gonna have this, this condition, which is called restricted eigenvalue. So I'm gonna assume that um, basically this lower bound holds um, for all delta in, in, in the um, C alpha of S. Okay, and if you, um, as an exercise, or for the next time, you can you can verify for yourself that um, the restricted null space property just says that for all delta in C one of S that are non-zero, this side is strictly positive. This guy is strictly positive, um, and the restricted eigenvalue condition is trying to lower bound that uniformly with this, which makes it much strong, a much stronger condition, and. Um, and this, this condition generally has something to do with um, eigenvalues, which next time we're going to talk about. But just as an exercise, show that uh, restricted null space property is equivalent to this condition. Um, and so then you can understand that this is a stronger, stronger condition. Okay. So this condition is going to be the key condition for us to, to show the um, nice properties of the lesson. Okay. Questions? Okay, I think the slides are there. So next time we're gonna show and approve, approve this result, which is the basic result about the p bound. So you, under this restricted uh, eigenvalue condition, you'd show the bound of the desired form. Um, so that would be the next thing. Uh, right, for the next I just look at this for, for uh, like in preparation of uh, of doing this here. Okay, questions, comments? No questions? Okay. Uh, thank you for listening and see you. you. I'm going to post probably, no problem, post the next homework soon enough. I think we have enough um, so we can start up. Um, just just check campus wire um, uh, today or tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.